Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. Do you freak when the car won't start? Are you tired of having to turn to your boyfriend every time the engine splutters? Then the car maintenance course for women at Bromley Adult Education Centre is a must. It promises to equip you, after one term, to carry out basic car maintenance and give your car a regular servicing. Not only will it give you independence, but it could save you a few quid too. 18-year-old Helen Dank signed up after buying a cheap second-hand car. I didn't have a clue about cars, and I thought it might help if I ever broke down on the motorway. I found out that my car was rattling at speed because the tyres needed balancing. My car had always done that, and I thought it was because it was old. I took it straight down the garage and told them what was wrong. The mechanic looked at me as if to say, "You don't know what you're talking about." But I explained to him about the course, and he admitted he was quite impressed. And they can't rip me off now either. Do you freak when the car won't start? Are you tired of having to turn to your boyfriend every time the engine splutters? Then the car maintenance course for women at Bromley Adult Education Centre is a must. It promises to equip you after one term to carry out basic car maintenance and give your car a regular servicing. Not only will it give you independence, but it could save you a few quid too. Eighteen-year-old Helen Dank signed up after buying a cheap second-hand car. I didn't have a clue about cars, and I thought it might help if I ever broke down on the motorway. I found out that my car was rattling at speed because the tyres needed balancing. My car had always done that, and I thought it was because it was old. I took it straight down the garage and told them what was wrong. The mechanic looked at me as if to say, "You don't know what you're talking about." But I explained to him about the course, and he admitted he was quite impressed. And they can't rip me off now either. Extract two. Well, there are people who say, "Oh, hello! I don't think you'll be able to help me, but I suppose it's worth a try." To this, I reply with heavy sarcasm, "Yes, well, we are fairly useless, but you never know. It's a long shot, but give it a whirl. We might surprise you." Then there are people who carry on a conversation after you've answered. You start off, "Hello, inquiries. Can I help you?" A distant voice says something like. And then he just left me standing there like an idiot with just one shoe on. You say hello, inquiries. Can I help you? They say something like, "Well, I couldn't just leave him." Oh, hello. Sorry. Yes. Um. Oh. Oh. I can't remember who I called now. The polite thing to do is wait until they've got a grip. The far more satisfying thing to do is ring off just as they remember what they wanted to ask. Well, there are people who say, "Oh, hello. I don't think you'll be able to help me, but I suppose it's worth a try." To this, I reply with heavy sarcasm, "Yes, well, we are fairly useless, but you never know. It's a long shot, but give it a whirl. We might surprise you." Then there are people who carry on a conversation after you've answered. You start off, "Hello, inquiries. Can I help you?" A distant voice says something like. And then he just left me standing there like an idiot with just one shoe on. 
You say hello. Inquiries. Can I help you? They say something like, "Well, I couldn't just leave him." Oh, hello. Sorry. Yes. Um. Oh. 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 I can't remember who I called now. The polite thing to do is wait until they've got a grip. The far more satisfying thing to do is ring off, just as they remember what they wanted to ask. Extract three. Apart from good food and drink, the main requisite for a successful picnic is, of course, delightful surroundings. Some people ignore this rule completely and get out their folding tables and wrapped-up sandwiches on grotty grass verges by the side of major roads and busy car parks. It is a particularly English folly to want to eat out of doors on high days and holidays, whatever the weather. Who has not seen people in Max sitting bizarrely under dripping trees in parks, glumly handing round the flask of tea and cheese and onion crisps? The obsessive picnic tradition probably originated in medieval times with pilgrims' wayside meals, as well as the gargantuan outdoor feasts held before hunting parties. By the seventeenth century, it was common entertainment for the gentry to eat out of doors in the rustic manner. However, so worried were they that inclement weather might spoil their great hooped dresses and satin breeches, that they dotted little Arcadian pavilions around their grounds as a precautionary measure to dive into if it rained. It was not until the eighteenth century that the essential picnic staple was invented by John Montagu, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, that evocative and much maligned British food icon that took his name. Apart from good food and drink, the main requisite for a successful picnic is, of course, delightful surroundings. Some people ignore this rule completely and get out their folding tables and wrapped-up sandwiches on grotty grass verges by the side of major roads and busy car parks. It is a particularly English folly to want to eat out of doors on high days and holidays, whatever the weather. Who has not seen people in Max sitting bizarrely under dripping trees in parks, glumly handing round the flask of tea and cheese and onion crisps? The obsessive picnic tradition probably originated in medieval times with pilgrims' wayside meals, as well as the gargantuan outdoor feasts held before hunting parties. By the seventeenth century, it was common entertainment for the gentry to eat out of doors in the rustic manner. However, so worried were they that inclement weather might spoil their great hooped dresses and satin breeches, that they dotted little Arcadian pavilions around their grounds as a precautionary measure to dive into if it rained. It was not until the eighteenth century that the essential picnic staple was invented by John Montagu, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, that evocative and much maligned British food icon that took his name. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear part of a radio interview with a diver. For questions seven to fifteen, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part two. John, how did you become interested in diving? I always had a great interest in underwater adventure. 
When I was about 13, I experimented with a friend by converting some submarine escape apparatus we found. I tied a sack of bricks around my waist and was lowered into about 15 feet of water in the harbour. When I jerked the rope to signal that I had had enough, I saw the rope snaking down towards me. I had to haul myself up the harbour wall with the bricks weighing me down and surfaced completely blue in the face. Oh. I then joined the local sub-aqua club, the first in the British Isles, but it wasn't until I joined the Royal Engineers that I was trained properly. What was so appealing? It was a new frontier. In those days, people didn't go underwater. Going into a different environment was a challenge, like going to the moon. Being able to move with a mere flick of a hand or foot is like flying. Has the equipment changed much since you started? In the army, we used modified firefighting apparatus. and We wore cumbersome rubber dry suits over a corduroy undersuit and were completely encased. The mind boggles when you look at the advances made since then. Is there anything you don't like underwater? <laughs> I've always felt uneasy around sharks. You hear of ploys to chase them off, but if a great white is heading for you at 80 miles per hour, you don't stand a chance. <laughs> Luckily, I've never been attacked by one, but some have come very close, and I saw one go for a cameraman once. Have you ever made any serious mistakes? The worst was when I got carried away during an archaeological search off Paphos in Cyprus. I saw an ancient marble slab and was determined to bring it to the surface. As I was struggling to bring it up, I suddenly realised I was running out of air. I had to drop the slab and surface too fast. I was swallowing water and I could hear rattling in my lungs. Oh. My limbs stopped working and I was being swept by a powerful current towards some jagged rocks. It was terrifying because it happened so slowly and I knew it was all my fault. Luckily, a chap taking photos drew alongside in a boat, said, everything all right, and dragged me out. Was that your most frightening experience? I think so, although I had another bad moment while trying to raise a crane that had sunk in the mud of a harbour. Two of us were tunnelling through the mud underneath it when I felt a pressure change in my ears and realised it was sinking on top of us. Oh. We eased back through the mud, unable to see a thing, and said a few well-chosen words to each other. What is the most beautiful place you have dived? Oh, Roatan, which is part of Honduras. The bay is secluded and full of wrecks from aircraft to boats dating back almost to the times of Columbus. The layers of marine life go on and on into the void, and the colours are more vivid than any I have seen. Have you ever really hurt yourself? <laughs> I smashed three front teeth out while testing a human torpedo device in Florida. Oh. I hit the wrong controls by mistake and shot into the roof of a cave. <laughs> Have your attitudes or preferences changed? I enjoy watching fish more now I've had my share of adventure. I'm also particularly interested in the conservation side. It didn't take long to realise that killing fish was a bit pointless and that if everyone did it, stocks would be depleted. What is the most important lesson that you have learned? You can never be too careful. Familiarity breeds contempt, and it's easy to forget safety checks. Mm. If you're going to learn, join a good club and learn with trained instructors. Buy the best equipment and don't dive alone. It could be your life. John, thanks for talking to me today. Now you'll hear part two again. John, how did you become interested in diving? I always had a great interest in underwater adventure. When I was about 13, I experimented with a friend by converting some submarine escape apparatus we found. I tied a sack of bricks around my waist and was lowered into about 15 feet of water in the harbour. When I jerked the rope to signal that I had had enough, I saw the rope snaking down towards me. I had to haul myself up the harbour wall with the bricks weighing me down and surfaced completely blue in the face. Oh. I then joined the local sub-aqua club, the first in the British Isles, but it wasn't until I joined the Royal Engineers that I was trained properly. What was so appealing? It was a new frontier. In those days, people didn't go underwater. 
Going into a different environment was a challenge, like going to the moon. Being able to move with a mere flick of a hand or foot is like flying. Has the equipment changed much since you started? In the army, we used modified firefighting apparatus, and we wore cumbersome rubber dry suits over a corduroy undersuit, and were completely encased. <laughs> the mind boggles when you look at the advances made since then. Is there anything you don't like underwater? <laughs> I've always felt uneasy around sharks. You hear of ploys to chase them off, but if a great white is heading for you at eighty miles per hour, you don't stand a chance. <laughs> Luckily, I've never been attacked by one, but some have come very close, and I saw one go for a cameraman once. Have you ever made any serious mistakes? The worst was when I got carried away during an archaeological search off Paphos in Cyprus. I saw an ancient marble slab and was determined to bring it to the surface. As I was struggling to bring it up, I suddenly realised I was running out of air. I had to drop the slab and surface too fast. I was swallowing water and I could hear rattling in my lungs.、Oh. My limbs stopped working and I was being swept by a powerful current towards some jagged rocks. It was terrifying because it happened so slowly and I knew it was all my fault. Luckily, a chap taking photos drew alongside in a boat, said, "Everything all right?" and dragged me out. Was that your most frightening experience? I think so. Although I had another bad moment while trying to raise a crane that had sunk in the mud of a harbour, two of us were tunnelling through the mud underneath it when I felt a pressure change in my ears and realised it was sinking on top of us.、Oh. We eased back through the mud, unable to see a thing. And said a few well-chosen words to each other. What is the most beautiful place you have dived?、Oh, Roatan, which is part of Honduras. The bay is secluded and full of wrecks from aircraft to boats dating back almost to the times of Columbus. The layers of marine life go on and on into the void, and the colours are more vivid than any I have seen. Have you ever really hurt yourself? <laughs> I smashed three front teeth out while testing a human torpedo device in Florida.、Oh. I hit the wrong controls by mistake and shot into the roof of a cave. <laughs> Have your attitudes or preferences changed? I enjoy watching fish more now I've had my share of adventure. I'm also particularly interested in the conservation side. It didn't take long to realise that killing fish was a bit pointless, and that if everyone did it, stocks would be depleted. What is the most important lesson that you have learned? You can never be too careful. Familiarity breeds contempt, and it's easy to forget safety checks.、Mm. If you're going to learn, join a good club and learn with trained instructors. Buy the best equipment and don't dive alone. It could be your life. John, thanks for talking to me today. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear part of a radio phone-in program about consumer competitions that appear in magazines or are run by shops, in which advice is given to people who regularly enter them. For questions sixteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D. Which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three.
OK, today I have with me Cathy Ford, winner of more than £500,000 worth of prizes in all sorts of consumer competitions and dubbed the Queen of Competitions by the British press. She's now editor of Competitors World magazine and, as an expert on competitions, has appeared regularly on TV. Cathy, let's go straight to our first caller and that's Diana. Diana, what's your query? Yes, hello Cathy. Well, in order to send in two entries to a competition where only one entry per person was allowed, I asked my best friend if I could submit an entry in her name. She agreed, and the understanding was that if her entry won, I would receive the prize, but I would buy her a small gift for allowing me to use her name. Well, the inevitable has happened. I've won a much-needed new washing machine, but in my friend's name... And she has now refused point-blank to hand the machine over. If I went to a lawyer, would I have any hope of getting my prize from her? Not even the faintest chance. I'm afraid that your efforts to evade the rules have not only cost you the prize, but also your best friend as well. And legally, you just don't have a leg to stand on. Even if you'd drawn up some sort of legal agreement with your erstwhile friend, I think you'd find that the law would still take a very dim view of your case, since it was obviously done with premeditated fraudulent intent. It's not worth trying to evade the rules, as you've just found out the hard way. Next, it's Ron. Ron, go ahead. You're through to Cathy. Someone told me that some firms that run competitions keep a blacklist of frequent prize winners and that I should use a lot of different aliases in order to avoid being put on such a list. Is this true? No. Competitors can sometimes get a little paranoid. And if they start going through a winless spell, and we all get them from time to time, they start to imagine that they've been blacklisted. No reputable firm would even contemplate such a measure. And the only time there's even a faint risk of this sort of thing happening is with in-store competitions, where an individual store manager might just conceivably think, oh, no, not him again, and deliberately disregard your entry. For mainstream competitions, however, such worries are groundless, and the use of aliases is not only unnecessary, but can even prove to be pretty stupid. Think about it for a moment. What would happen if you won a holiday under a phony name? Or were asked to prove your identity to collect a prize at a presentation ceremony? My advice is to stick with your own name, and if prizes stop arriving, take a long, close look at the quality of your entries, rather than trying to blame it on blacklists. OK, next it's Stan. Stan, what can Cathy help you with? Uh, well, Cathy, I recently entered a competition which asked you to estimate the distance between a store in Newcastle and its London head office using the shortest route. In order to make my entry as accurate as possible, I used a Routemaster computer program to determine the shortest possible way and calculate the distance, quite literally, from door to door. Imagine my astonishment, therefore, when I sent for the result and found that the answer they had given as being correct was fully 73 miles longer than mine. I know my answer was correct, so do I have grounds to make a formal objection? I'm sorry, but no, you haven't. As far as the promoter is concerned, the key word in the instructions here is estimate. They expect you to guess, not measure the distance accurately and it's likely that their own answer will also be based purely on an estimate. As a result, judges will always be right, even when they are wrong, as in a case like this. And in entering the competition at all, you have agreed to abide by the rule that states the judge's decision is final. Distance estimation competitions have always given rise to this sort of controversy, and although court cases have been brought... The entrant very seldom succeeds in having the decision changed. You have only to check the distance charts in road atlases to see how this type of problem occurs. No two ever agree, yet as far as I know, towns simply don't move around very much. OK, and now on to our next caller, who is... Uh... Now you'll hear part three again. OK, 
Today I have with me Cathy Ford, winner of more than £500,000 worth of prizes in all sorts of consumer competitions and dubbed the Queen of Competitions by the British press. She's now editor of Competitors World magazine and as an expert on competitions has appeared regularly on TV. Cathy, let's go straight to our first caller and that's Diana. Diana, what's your query? Yes, hello Cathy. Well, in order to send in two entries to a competition where only one entry per person was allowed, I asked my best friend if I could submit an entry in her name. She agreed, and the understanding was that if her entry won, I would receive the prize, but I would buy her a small gift for allowing me to use her name. Well, the inevitable has happened. I've won a much-needed new washing machine, but in my friend's name... And she has now refused point-blank to hand the machine over. If I went to a lawyer, would I have any hope of getting my prize from her? Not even the faintest chance. I'm afraid that your efforts to evade the rules have not only cost you the prize, but also your best friend as well, and legally you just don't have a leg to stand on. Even if you'd drawn up some sort of legal agreement with your erstwhile friend, I think you'd find that the law would still take a very dim view of your case, since it was obviously done with premeditated fraudulent intent. It's not worth trying to evade the rules, as you've just found out the hard way. Next, it's Ron. Ron, go ahead. You're through to Cathy. Someone told me that some firms that run competitions keep a blacklist of frequent prize winners and that I should use a lot of different aliases in order to avoid being put on such a list. Is this true? No. Competitors can sometimes get a little paranoid. And if they start going through a winless spell, and we all get them from time to time, they start to imagine that they've been blacklisted. No reputable firm would even contemplate such a measure. And the only time there's even a faint risk of this sort of thing happening is with in-store competitions, where an individual store manager might just conceivably think, oh, no, not him again, and deliberately disregard your entry. For mainstream competitions, however, such worries are groundless, and the use of aliases is not only unnecessary, but can even prove to be pretty stupid. Think about it for a moment. What would happen if you won a holiday under a phony name? Or were asked to prove your identity to collect a prize at a presentation ceremony? My advice is to stick with your own name, and if prizes stop arriving, take a long, close look at the quality of your entries, rather than trying to blame it on blacklists. OK, next it's Stan. Stan, what can Cathy help you with? Uh, well, Cathy... I recently entered a competition which asked you to estimate the distance between a store in Newcastle and its London head office using the shortest route. In order to make my entry as accurate as possible, I used a Routemaster computer program to determine the shortest possible way and calculate the distance, quite literally, from door to door. Imagine my astonishment, therefore, when I sent for the result and found that the answer they had given as being correct was fully 73 miles longer than mine. I know my answer was correct, so do I have grounds to make a formal objection? I'm sorry, but no, you haven't. As far as the promoter is concerned, the key word in the instructions here is estimate. They expect you to guess, not measure the distance accurately and it's likely that their own answer will also be based purely on an estimate. As a result, judges will always be right, even when they are wrong, as in a case like this. And in entering the competition at all, you have agreed to abide by the rule that states the judge's decision is final. Distance estimation competitions have always given rise to this sort of controversy, and although court cases have been brought... The entrant very seldom succeeds in having the decision changed. You have only to check the distance charts in road atlases to see how this type of problem occurs. No two ever agree, yet as far as I know, towns simply don't move around very much. OK, and now on to our next caller, who is... Uh... That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part 4 consists of two tasks. 
you will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about their day at work. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what happened at work. Now look at task two. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H each speaker's feeling about what happened. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker 1 I didn't think there was any point doing it, but I had to just do as I was told and get on with it. It took me ages, because it all had to be ready ahead of the meeting at the end of the day, and I slogged away without much of a break to get it all done. And guess what? They didn't have time to discuss it in the meeting, which is what I'd guessed anyway. It's the sort of thing that happens quite often, but I've got used to it now. In this particular case, I think that what I did might very well prove to have been worth it eventually, because I think there's a good chance they'll go ahead with the project before too long. Speaker 2 Well, nobody's perfect, and that includes him, so I don't know why he thinks he can tell everyone else off when he's always getting things wrong himself. There's no point arguing with him, though. You just get in even more trouble, as some of my colleagues have found out to their cost. So I just had to take it when he came and made a big thing about how badly I'd done the work. In actual fact, the problem was a trivial one that took about ten seconds to fix. I never let it get to me, though. I know what he's like, and it doesn't bother me. Speaker 3 it's strange to suddenly find myself singled out. I never thought they'd choose me for the trade fair. I assumed there were far better candidates. It's the sort of thing that will stand me in very good stead and might lead to other things too. I never expected such a thing to happen and if I'm honest, I'm not sure I'm ready for it. The prospect of going there and being responsible for potential deals and new business fills me with a certain amount of dread. I'd hate to mess it up. Speaker 4 I wasn't exactly looking forward to it, as I was expecting her to be very negative about my performance in recent times. I'd anticipated what she might have a go at me for, and I'd prepared my defence. And indeed, she did start off by asking me how I thought I'd been doing recently, but I was surprised to see that she was very much on my side. It was, I thought, a very good piece of management, acknowledging that there was room for improvement, but balancing it with praise for the positives. Speaker 5 I thought there would be lots of arguments, and very little would be agreed, if anything, because those people simply do not get on well together and don't have any respect for each other normally. Well, that's not what happened. This time everything went through smoothly, and the whole thing was over in next to no time. Quite why it all went so well is something I can't work out. It doesn't make sense that they should suddenly all agree. There must be some logical reason, but I can't see it.
Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. I didn't think there was any point doing it, but I had to just do as I was told and get on with it. It took me ages because it all had to be ready ahead of the meeting at the end of the day, and I slogged away without much of a break to get it all done. And guess what? They didn't have time to discuss it in the meeting, which is what I'd guessed anyway. It's the sort of thing that happens quite often, but I've got used to it now. In this particular case, I think that what I did might very well prove to have been worth it eventually, because I think there's a good chance they'll go ahead with the project before too long. Speaker two. Well, nobody's perfect, and that includes him. So I don't know why he thinks he can tell everyone else off when he is always getting things wrong himself. There's no point arguing with him, though. You just get in even more trouble, as some of my colleagues have found out to their cost. So I just had to take it when he came and made a big thing about how badly I'd done the work. In actual fact, the problem was a trivial one that took about ten seconds to fix. I never let it get to me, though. I know what he's like, and it doesn't bother me. Speaker three. It's strange to suddenly find myself singled out. I never thought they'd choose me for the trade fair. I assumed there were far better candidates. It's the sort of thing that will stand me in very good stead, and might lead to other things too. I never expected such a thing to happen, and if I'm honest, I'm not sure I'm ready for it. The prospect of going there and being responsible for potential deals and new business fills me with a certain amount of dread. I'd hate to mess it up. Speaker four. I wasn't exactly looking forward to it, as I was expecting her to be very negative about my performance in recent times. I'd anticipated what she might have a go at me for, and I'd prepared my defence. And indeed, she did start off by asking me how I thought I'd been doing recently. But I was surprised to see that she was very much on my side. It was, I thought, a very good piece of management, acknowledging that there was room for improvement, but balancing it with praise for the positives. Speaker five. I thought there would be lots of arguments, and very little would be agreed, if anything, because those people simply do not get on well together. And don't have any respect for each other normally. Well, that's not what happened. This time everything went through smoothly, and the whole thing was over in next to no time. Quite why it all went so well is something I can't work out. It doesn't make sense that they should suddenly all agree. There must be some logical reason, but I can't see it. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. Then your supervisor will collect all the question papers and answer sheets.